Hi, good evening, guys. Uh, welcome back to Biomechanical Institute for Orthodontics. Uh, and welcome back here on the BOTCH series, the Orthodontic Damage Control Lecture Series. Um, again, we're here uh, on our fourth episode, and uh, we thank you for uh, for tuning on with uh, with uh, our show. So uh, we've been exposed to about uh, 50 to 60,000 people already around the uh, around the world, with about uh, 100 shares on our videos and about, um, uh, I think it's around 30,000 views or so. And still, there's a lot of demand uh, from those episodes that we have already taken down. Uh, but don't worry, you can just uh, send us a message and uh, we can link you up with those episodes. So uh, we're here again tonight. And uh, Adit and I are uh, here to talk about um, something that is... Uh, uh, it's a very hot topic around right now, to be honest, and it's something that uh, really is, just gives a lot more questions. It's it's, uh, it's something that gives more questions uh, as we practice it, as uh, people are debating around it, and it's basically about the ligation systems and if uh, uh, these passive systems, if they really work. So um, Adit and I would love to talk about this tonight. Um, we could have a second part to this. But uh, what we want to do is we want to look at um, evidences. We want to look at uh, our cases. Uh, we want to show you our cases and see how we can uh, really apply this, if it really matters, uh, if it really could help us, or if it could um, botch up our cases. So uh, if you have any questions, just comment down below on the comment section, uh, and we'll try to answer everybody as much as we could. All right. So good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you all for joining us. And uh, so as Dr. Powers already introduced us about this session, uh, I'm going to be speaking about uh, uh, the topic. And the topic is, uh, it's, 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 it's based on perspectives. So uh, today's topic is, uh, is not laid down for anyone. It's about the self-ligation versus the conventional ligation. So we're not going to talk about any particular brand. We're not going to talk about any particular uh, 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 philosophy, uh, but we're going to be talking about um, what we're going to be especially talking about is uh, what we are hearing. Is that actually true or is it, is it false? So today we're going to be actually speaking from an evidence point of view. So today is going to be more like a systematic review <laughs> or an analysis uh, more so, and it's 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 also going to be uh, absolutely based on evidence, and you're not going to be seeing many finished cases because that's that's not the agenda today. So we're not we're not promoting uh, orthodontic finishing or anything of that sort. We're talking about the evidence revolving around what we hear about these two systems. Okay, so let's let's begin. Uh, as we already know, uh, we've 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 classified. Uh, uh, our orthodontic screw-ups uh, more onto the technical as well as non-technical screw-up part of it. Now, this particular topic would convene around diagnostic screw-up as well as mechanical screw-up, and it's also non-technical when it comes to social media-based screw-up. Now, why I'm trying to say it is because nowadays, the treatment is not treatment-driven. It's more of appliance-driven. Uh, I'm sure Dr. Power would agree with me on this. Uh, I've seen so many practitioners uh, go by the fact that they decide on even extraction versus non-extraction based on the appliance they use. So that's, that's not the right way of how we should deal with things. It should be the other way around. We should diagnose it first, and then we should choose what kind of appliance is best suited for that kind of a treatment. So that becomes a diagnostic botch up by itself. Now, mechanical, why is it mechanical? Because uh, we think that because of the various claims that these self-ligation brackets have around these days, uh, we, we try to think of it as, oh, we might, we might not need to do the conventional things that we do to probably get a high canine down or probably uh, to, to alleviate crowding. And we can just put the brackets in, run the wire and the very light copper night eyes, and it's just going to take care of itself. So that's a mechanical screw up. I mean, which you would actually see uh, after you possibly uh, put in those wires. I mean, you, you might just push uh, all the teeth out into the bone, out of the bone, rather. So non-technical, 
why is it non technical it's it's probably because uh, we 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 have so influenced by social media these days as i've already covered this in the last uh, i think the episode 1 that we we see a lot of these beautiful cases being done by uh, 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 key opinion leaders of different uh, brackets and 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 we see those those amazing treatment plans and treatment uh, treatments happening so we try to replicate those so what i what i'm trying to say is reproducibility is one of the most important factors when it comes to uh, learning from others there's no point if you are not able to reproduce what i am doing if you're not getting the same results that i am getting then what's the whole point of me showing you something so it's very very important uh, that way uh now there's this there's this very very interesting quote and i, I would like uh, i would like to just read it human knowledge is always frail and subject to revision that should make us humble and exceedingly careful in claiming neither too much nor too little uh this is this is a this was this was an excellent uh, quote and this is so true in today's world uh yeah so now let's 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 get on to self ligation versus conventional ligation uh i'm going to be speaking about it first you've already seen uh, about the, the next two cases most of you have already seen those two cases but i'm just going to run through them to show you what i'm actually talking about uh the what i'm actually talking about with these two cases is that the reproducibility factor what i have possibly done on one case to get beautiful results was not true when i tried to replicate the same on another case okay uh again let's go on to this case everybody has possibly seen this case already so i'm just going to be running through it i'm not going to go into the mechanics of it because this this is not this is not about the mechanics dr pau is going to go more into that i'm going to be talking about the ideology and the diagnosis behind it you see the heavy amount of crowding that this case had most of you had already seen this definitely an extraction case but this particular case did not want extraction she did not want any kind of uh, Uh, screws or any extractions, any third molar extractions, nothing. Um, and uh, so I had to go in for a lot of IPR in this particular case. I, and this was the time when probably uh, uh, Damon brackets were on the hype, and I just gave it a go. I thought I'll just use them. Although I I did a lot of IPR uh, sequentially in this case, uh, at the areas of different crowdings, as you can see that. for example i started off with a little bit of ipr over here and a little bit of ipr over here and all these things in order to not lose anchorage because if i would have ipr all uh, everywhere i would have just lost anchorage because all the teeth would have probably moved forward and i would have lost the benefit of uh, interproximal reduction so i had to do a sequential interproximal reduction used light wires had a lot of issues with this particular case especially in terms of controlling the uh, anterior posterior inclination they flared out there was an open bite and i had to do a lot more interproximal reduction reduction a lot of elastics were used and finally i was able to get a decent finish no doubt uh, even the profile it has gone forward it has moved forward the lips have moved forward but still within the range uh, in uh, in terms of patient satisfaction she was still satisfied with the outcome as you can see that i've flared the lower in sizes uh, quite a bit the uppers have not flared because uh, i i had some good control in terms of elastics and uh, those things but the lowers i can control them i uh, they extruded and then they move forward uh, so so what i'm trying to say is i'm i'm going to get to the evidence uh, now this is about the treatment objective so i was i was able to get a decent treatment outcome out of nothing so this gave me the confidence now with this confidence i moved on to this case now everybody has probably seen this case as well so i'm just going to rush through it i thought i'm able i'm going to be able to gain the same amount of space looking at those excellent cases on uh, social media uh, i i tried to uh, replicate the same with these cases and i thought that yeah i i've, I've seen people opening up spaces out of nothing so i i would be easily able to open up these spaces using open coil springs uh, which i tried the initial plan in this particular case was just extracting the 14 because i was under the impression that i was uh, i i would be able to open the space by extracting this this was pretty easy by just placing an open coil spring and i would be able to expand the lower arch considering that they are pretty narrow uh, from the from the word go 
so as you can see, the arches seem narrow, huge buckle corridors were avail available. So huge buckle corridors was actually uh, one of the uh, taglines with these self-ligation bracket uh, propagators that, oh, you see uh, buckle corridors, that means that you can expand. And there was no evidence around it. All of these were just anecdotal and, and, and probably just spoken for by uh, key opinion leaders. And we as orthodontists, we as learners, uh, were very influenced by such, uh, such, such huge, such words. And uh, we, we, we were under the impression that we could replicate the same. So this is what we're talking about, reproducibility. Uh, so I decided to use a very thin wire and uh, placed an implant over here, started to retract the canines, just to tip them back a little bit so that I can, I can, I can get some space over here. Uh, but but as you can see, five months passed and absolutely nothing changed. I was not able to move the canine a bit. I, I did not get any kind of intercanine or intermolar width or increase or anything, although that was unstable, but still I had to expand. Uh, I placed this open coil spring over here as well uh, to get some lip bumper effect, but nothing helped. Uh, I was expecting a lot of change considering the fact that the previous patient that you'd seen had had, uh, had, had tremendous results. I mean, but this case was showing another, nothing. And then finally I had to resort to a T loop over here and uh, start, I, I had to get the, get the canines back. And I had to now change my entire uh, treatment uh, objective because I was not able to control the uh, lower proclination. So I had to extract the lower incisor over here uh, because I promised the patient that I wouldn't be extracting any, any other tooth except for the one four. So I couldn't just go and jump the gun and say that I, I have to extract all four premolars in this particular case, which was actually my mistake. So I, I, I tried to just convince the patient that I'm gonna be extracting one lower incisor and then it should still be okay. I, I would be able to correct the crowding as well as the inclination of the lower incisors. But as you can see in the third, third row, even after the extraction of an incisor, I was not able to correct the proclination because I was not able to get the desired amount of expansion that I probably thought I would achieve. Uh, yeah, so now, there was a situation where the midline was moving because I was trying to move this particular canine here and I was getting this lateral incisor out and the force of this coming out pushed these three to the right. And uh, finally, the midline moved a lot to the right. Now I had no space on the left to correct it. So I had to extract a premolar as you can see over here. So now I told him that I have to extract uh, tooth number two, four. And he agreed to that. And finally, I used some indirect anchorage uh, got it back. I, I used anchorage from the upper uh, you know, screws onto the lower canines in order to get them back as well. And finally, when I was uh, uh, still not able to control the inclination, I went into uh, round wires with some closing loops to give some differential moments over there to tip the teeth back. And finally, I was uh, in a position to get a decent uh, uh, inclination of the upper and lower uh, in sizes. So as you can see, it's a hard task. And the mistake I made was going appliance driven. I thought that I'm going to be using this particular bracket and this is going to give me the desired results. So that is the mistake over here. I should have diagnosed this case differently and then decided which appliance was to be used in this particular case. So now given a chance, I would never treat these cases in such a way. What I'm trying to say is the factor of reproducibility. It does not depend on the appliance. Uh, don't let anyone tell you that, oh, with, with this particular bracket, with Damon or with, uh, with other genius or with any, any kind of self lagging bracket, it's very easy to open up spaces because that is a mistake. It's, it's, not, it's not a fact. I mean, you, it's not a fact. There. It's, it's a mistake because uh, you might get that kind of an expansion on one patient, but if you try the same on another patient, it may or may not work. But in my case, it has never worked. So reprodu reproducibility factor with me has always been less than 10%. And that's exactly why I have to uh, reconsider and I have to plan all over again when in, in cases where I've gone appliance driven from the very uh, beginning. Uh, as you can see, this was the finish, not a very ideal finish, but acceptable uh, compared to which I had been through. 
the third example is this case again, where I had tried the same thing. Definitely, this is an extraction case, right? It's an upper and lower extraction, four by four case, uh, 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 an open and shut case. But again, I, I went appliance, appliance driven. I, I placed in the appliance. I thought that I'm going to be able to uh, get the desired amount of expansion or proclination. Because of course, uh, one thing, let, let's make one thing very clear that no amount of transfers expansion is going to accommodate enough space to correct anterior posterior issues right so let's let's uh, not get into that aspect of it if someone tells you that oh you can expand and then gain space to push the lips back it's absolutely foolish uh, uh, because of the Ricketts law, right? I mean, uh, one mm on the canine would, would give you an arch length increase of about one millimeter. It's, it's about 100% over there. But as and when it goes posterior, the amount of arch length increase reduces considerably. But again, in this particular case, I was able to get a desired uh, decent outcome uh, when, you, when you look at it, but the, pro the profile has proclined, definitely. But then again, now it's a question of whether or not the patient likes it. Stability is another question altogether. But yes, as you can see, the upper incisors over here have proclined in the superimpositions. Um, uh, the lowers have not broken much, but still in this particular case, I was able to get uh, or able to alleviate the crowding. The second case that I showed you, I wasn't able to do that. I waited for about a year and nothing happened. So what I'm trying to say again is, uh, you can't use the same appliance on all patients and expect a same or similar outcome. It's not gonna happen. It's, it's, it's a question of reproducibility and that depends on many, many other factors uh, like the bone physiology, the patient, the sex, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the anatomy or the amount of buccal bone available, the pre-inclination of your teeth, uh, the, uh, the tongue size and, 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 and many other factors. Uh, so it's not only about a particular appliance that we're going to be using or not. So, Pao, are we clear in here? Yeah. Do you want to add on to something? Do you have a different opinion, yeah. outlook? Well, actually, I like what you said about the uh, appliance first uh, kind of mentality, which would affect us. And uh, I've encountered so many dentists who, who think this way. That, and and mm -hmm. I don't really blame our dentists, but I would rather blame, I won't blame our colleagues. I would blame our manufacturers because that's how mm -hmm. they market it. And that's how they market it aggressively. They would come up to you and tell you that, hey, I have a solution to your problem. You have a class two case. Here's the treatment plan and they don't even know what your diagnosis really is but they lay down the treatment plan they say that this is the appliance that is effective for all types and that's basically a, a trap where where we uh, find ourselves in so it's very important that we as doctors okay that we we shouldn't forget the the importance of our diagnosis and then going into which appliance would be the best um, uh, and not thinking it that way as you said uh, thinking about, hey, I have an appliance and I have a case that uh, pretty much would possibly fix this. So let me try it. That's, that's not the right way to do it. Yeah. So. Okay. So, uh, yeah, uh, absolutely true. And uh, I, I, I've just seen we have Dr. Justin Arnold watching uh, along with us. And I'm sure he would agree with this because he aggressively goes against people who go appliance driven. I've seen that in most of his Facebook posts. And he, he does the right thing. Uh, as well. So uh, I, I would inculcate the same kind of habit. And uh, it's a responsibility by key opinion leaders or by manufacturers. Uh, and more so, more so, more than that, it is uh, a responsibility by, uh, by editors of different uh, journals, especially, that are not to uh, fall for such marketing gimmicks and publish the, the actual data. Because I've seen so many, so many of these uh, uh, articles which are published these days in, 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 in uh, big uh, journals, uh, which, which actually really don't make sense. Uh, the standards may be going lower, but I think it's a big responsibility because the current orthodontic residents and uh, practitioners, they actually follow the lead. They read a lot of these journals and then they follow them. Uh, so I think, yeah. Uh, so let's let's move on. Our patients forward, not backward. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So 
The question, will a particular appliance or same mechanics achieve same results in different people? Uh, the question that I've been uh, asking in the first few slides. In my experience, the answer is a big fat no. Uh, reproducibility is always a concern with me. Um, I mean, the, the, the things that even I do, I'm not probably able to reproduce them in all the cases. Uh, uh, he's been practiced, uh, a little too much. Okay, so uh, let's get on the debate. Now, what are these, what are the... Your connection is a little bit faulty. Is it? Uh, can you hear me? Yep, now. Can you hear me now? Yep, better. Okay. So is it true extraction extractions? Is it true that it's very easy to level and align with these brackets? Is it true that the space closes really fast? Is it true that there are less anchorage burnouts with such brackets? Is it true that the anterior posterior inclination or control is better with these brackets? Is it true that the bone actually expands with the teeth or tooth? Are wider smiles more aesthetic? Do they actually go in and provide and produce really light forces as they claim to be? Are they really better for oral hygiene? Do they actually increase patient cooperation? And finally, is there actually a less chair time involved when using these brackets? So we're gonna be answering all these questions in this presentation. Again, uh, this is a very, very interesting take. Surrounding the hype around the fixated practitioners of self-ligation brackets exclusively are agreeable words and phrases such as perfection, excellence, best for the patient, less share time, more beautiful, face-driven, high-tech, low force, low friction, and bone adaptation. So these are very big words. Now let's just see whether they are actually evidence-based or absolutely anecdotal. Uh, first, let's, let's get to the basics of uh, the stability when it comes to extraction or non-extraction. Now the claim has been that with the use of self-ligating brackets, the percentage of cases in which we would need to extract teeth are lesser. Now that depends not on the brackets, that depends on where you're going to put your teeth finally. Now, ideally, your incisors are supposed to be between the FFA point and the FA point. Now that is going to be, the FFA point is somewhere between the superior and the glabella, as you can see over here. Now, this is a very interesting paper, which is called an angle. Uh, so how do you plan if you're able to place your inside particular point, it is aesthetically better for the patient. Coming to stability, lower incisor position and stability. Proclining the lower incisors more than a limit and again affected stability. Expansion in the mandibular arch, especially the intercanine width is highly unstable. Moving mandibular Start sharp in that point, which is two millimeter advancement of the lower incisors beyond the A pogonion can lead to post retention lingual collapse of the incisors. Now, these are very, very big papers. Now, for optimal periodontal health, the root must be centered in the alveolus, right? to allow adequate bone on both the sides, that's the labial as well as the lingual surfaces. Now, very interesting paper, Matsumoto et al. reported that a 50% increase in the probability of the dehiscence when well-positioned lower incisors were advanced two millimeters or eight degrees. So 50% increase in the chances of dehiscence is just absolutely too much. Now, this is one of my cases, as you can see the girl, the first case that I presented, the lower incisors has moved forward by more than 10 degrees. So that means at some certain point of time, according to Matsumoto, 
she is supposed to have dehiscence on the lower incisors. So that is really detrimental to the stability. So is it right? I mean, are we doing it the right way? Now, people might claim that, oh, you have probably done this wrong. You could have used low torque brackets on the lowers. You could have used some low torque brackets on the uppers and that would have maintained the inclination or whatsoever. I do agree with them when it comes to an extraction case because you have some space to control all these things. But when you absolutely don't have any space, are you trying to tell me that you are going to be able to control the inclination of incisors by just using a thick gauge wire and a low torque bracket without any space? So how are you going to alleviate the crowding in the first place? I mean, there must be some space for the teeth to decrowd. And how is that space going to come? Is it just expansion mm -hmm. or is it also some anterior posterior movement? So the claims that we can absolutely control the anterior posterior movement when it comes to such braces is false and fake. Also another point and another important factor was which was considered uh, as, as a very important factor when it came to extraction versus non-extraction was a nasolabial angle. But this paper in the angle, uh, Andrews again, has uh, debunked it. You can clearly see that these two patients over here have a very similar nasolabial angle, but the teeth, positions of the teeth are absolutely different. She has retroclined teeth, low placed, and this lady has proclined teeth, which are proclined and flared. So the nasolabial angle is pretty much the same. So are you going to decide on the extraction or non extraction just based on nasolabial angle? Doesn't really make much sense. Uh, now, let's get on to the evidence which revolves around uh, extraction or non-extraction coming to such brackets uh, or claims with self-ligation brackets. So the endless enigma of extractions and expansions, do they actually transform an extraction case to a non-extraction case? Uh, Dr. Little and Riedel, I mean, they're, these papers that I'm going to be showing you, they're like landmark papers, highly cited and... Uh, and all of them are uh, the, the, the ultimate truth because the, the, the study has been done in a very, very robust manner. So uh, Dr. Little and Rich uh, Riedel have published a paper, uh, mandibular arch length increase during the mixed dentition, post-retention evaluation and stability. Now, very clearly, he has mentioned over here that Lateral cephalometric superimpositions of the mandible has shown variable molar and incisor change after retention. When a particular treatment was done non-extraction, which was actually supposed to be done in an extraction fashion, there was a lot of change in the incisor alignment mm -hmm. and the mandibular angle as well. Now, there is another very interesting study which was done by Dr. McNamara and group uh, which, which clearly states that there was a study, this study actually compared uh, expansion alone using a, a rapid mandible, a rapid uh, maxillary expander on the upper alone to a group which used RME on the upper and a Schwartz on the lower. And they clearly said that even just a rapid maxillary expander on the upper was bound to relapse and it relapsed quite a bit compared to the group which also expanded the mandible to contain the maxilla as well. So, and definitely the fact that I've already mentioned before, the factors including stability are, are enough uh, to show that extraction should be a diagnostic factor and should not be uh, a, a, a treatment objective. So uh, it should not be appliance driven that we're going to extract based on this appliance or that appliance. It should be a diagnostic criteria which should be uh, catered for from the very beginning of the uh, case itself. So the next is, uh, now next we would talk about appropriately applied extraction treatment does not produce routine adverse effects on profiles. There is another very big claim which says, and I'm sure you would have heard of this as well. Everybody listening to me would have heard of this as well. That, oh, if you extract, you might lose the fullness of your lips. And so it's better not to extract. 
So this theory has been debunked again by these two beautiful papers, arch width after extraction and non-extraction treatment by uh, Ginelli. Now, he has very, very clearly uh, put it up that extraction treatment does not result in narrower dental arches compared to non-extraction treatment. So now this goes to say that if we ac actually think that when we extract, we are gonna narrow the arch, it's false. That does not happen. Secondly, we have another very interesting paper by Dr. Bowman, and I had this chance to speak with him uh, where he, uh, very, very, uh, he was, he was, he's very aggressive, especially, uh, and, and uh, very clear about the fact, uh, uh, which goes around extraction versus non-extraction when it comes to such appliance, uh, driven, uh, treatment objectives. So he concluded in his study, the aesthetic impact of extraction and non-extraction. And these are two very, very big, uh, people. I mean, uh, Dr. Bowman and, uh, Dr. Johnson, uh, they concluded that it is concluded that extraction treatment can produce improved facial aesthetics for many patients who present with some combination of crowding and protrusion. Uh, and the third, uh, the paper, an extraction approach to borderline tooth size and arch length pro problems in patients with satisfactory profiles by Dr. Boley. Again, their assessment was uh, that they found the mouth area of the patients which were treated by extraction that they improved and not adversely affected 92% of the time. So that's a very big number to uh, misguide people by saying that if you extract teeth, your arches are gonna get narrower. Your buccal corridors are gonna be uh, seen much more. You're gonna have those black holes. Your smile's not gonna be uh, very, very aesthetic. And uh, finally, there's another very important and very, very interesting paper by Dr. Kim. Extraction versus non-extraction, arch widths and smile aesthetics. Uh, he concluded that when the arch width of both the groups, that is extraction and non-extractions were measured from most labial surface of the teeth, the average arch width of both the arches was significantly wider. I mean, he said that the arch width was more wider in the extraction sample. It was about 1.8 millimeters wider than the mandible. Now, the mean aesthetic score and the number of teeth displayed during the smile did not differ, did not differ between the groups. The results mm -hmm. indicate that the arch width is not decreased mm -hmm. at a constant arch depth because of extraction treatment and smile aesthetics are the same in both the groups. So I think these four papers mm -hmm. written by really, really big guys should be enough to debunk mm -hmm. all the factors which go around smile aesthetics and, 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 and calling it uh, that wider smiles or, 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 or extraction treatments narrow the arch and they make faces look pretty flatter and all those things. It absolutely depends on your objective mm -hmm. and your uh, methodology and your ideal, uh, your, your final goals of treatment. Do we have any questions, Dr. Pao? Yes, uh, from Dr. Raid Said. Do uh -huh. you think in a case with a constricted upper arch without crossbite, when we expand the upper arch and simultaneously lower arch, the intracanine width won't increase. And so will it affect the stability? Because most of the recent scholars, including Professor Sato, say that when lower arch is uprighted, the results are highly stable, that some of the scholars say there is no need of a retainer. Your thoughts on that, please? Okay. So... Uh, what's he, what he's probably saying is when it comes to uh, tipped lower posterior teeth, upright posterior teeth are definitely more stable. But what I'm talking about is particularly the intercanine width, right? Increase in the intercanine width, and I'm going to be <coughs> citing a paper later which says that there was a 10-year uh, uh, retention uh, study which was done on patients uh, on, on whom the intercanine width was increased. And the study very clearly pointed out that the intercanine width increased. Yes, it increased in both the groups, that is extraction, non-extraction, self-ligating, as well as conventional brackets. It increased in both these groups. But post five years or six years, 
the intercanine width and the lowers, the, it started to narrow, it started to constrict back to its original intercanine width. So that, that goes to say that you have to give permanent retention. The minute something goes wrong with your retention, everything goes, everything falls back into the original. It starts getting back into its original uh, initial arch width. And that's exactly why even Tweed follows the same ideology of not increasing the intercanine width. All right. You want to add something to it? Um, I think if you're going to ask me, uh, we're, we're seeing a lot of these um, studies and they're very, very, very strong studies uh, also. Uh, but with the uh, human matter, I mean, we, if we look at it from a perspective, from another perspective with a human matter, mm -hmm. there's just a lot of variables that would go along one individual that would probably be different for another or maybe even for another race. Um, uh, we, we, I think we have to also understand uh, in a deeper perspective, the methodologies included in these studies and also the inclusion and exclusion criteria of these studies and see how they could, um, uh, apply to certain races uh, or certain individuals that we're treating. So, um, it, like you said, there's a lot of studies going around internationally as well, and they're being published in big uh, uh, publishing um, um, uh, groups. Uh, and it's kind of curious, you know, they, these papers just go through uh, reviews. They, they go through um, uh, a lot of standards or processes before they get published. Um, and one would speak for uh, against one another, one would approve of another. And um, I think, you know, uh, we're again, I uh, just want to affirm everybody that we're not trying to uh, disprove or approve, but we're rather challenging everyone to think from uh, more perspectives than what the manufacturers are just saying that, okay, this is just, this is the best treatment for you. And that's, that's what we're trying to debunk here, where we're trying to uh, uh, lead people into different, um, um, different avenues of uh, the way that we can think in regards to how we treat our patients and how what we use in our appliances. I, I think Dr. Pao is playing a little diplomatic over here. Uh, but uh, I, on the other hand, I'm, 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 very, um, uh, I'm very ruthless when it comes to such uh, topics. And uh, I have a very clear understanding that, uh, You're a little choppy, uh, Doctor Adam. Able to do. We didn't. We didn't sense. get your last ten seconds. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, I'm I'm pretty ruthless when it comes to yeah I'm pretty ruthless again when it comes to. Uh, uh, of uh, or mentional because for me it is it is, it is all about the uh, the mechanic or, and and probably biology as well. Uh, but it, it's it's not a blind. I do understand. Uh, Doctor, maybe you can just try to uh, fix the connection a little bit. Yeah. Am I back? Yes, you are. We lost you for a bit. Okay. So, uh, yeah. back? Yes. Okay. So, uh, I don't know why I'm saying my internet is going to say. Yeah. So, let's get on with it. Uh, I was, I was just, uh, you just raised a question as to evidence one side, patient perception one, one side, right? So what 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 do the patients really want? Uh, such such uh, wider smile and uh, uh, and all these things. How are we going to deal with that question? So yeah, this 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 paper brings it right onto that topic. So does the buccal corridor really matter? Because uh, I've I've heard a lot of uh, doctors say that uh, very clearly say that okay fine uh, buccal corridor means expansion. It's it's a very clear indicator for them. Now this study. Uh, from uh, Texas, the effects of buccal corridor space on arch form and smile aesthetics, it clear, the results are very clear. There was no significant difference in the smile scores 
related to buckles, uh, sorry, the buckle corridors for all samples and all viewers. Dentist, dentists in particular rated broader arch forms as more aesthetic than untreated arch forms. Mm -hmm. Orthodontists also rated broader arch forms as more aesthetic than narrow tapered arch forms. Lay people, now you're talking about the patients, lay people showed no preference of arch form. So basically, it is us who have that inside our head and it's not the patient. And we are trying to put that in the patient's head. Uh, conclusions are this, the study actually demonstrates the presence of uh, the buccal corridor uh, uh, as, as uh, a non-influential uh, factor in smile aesthetics. Uh, however, there are differences in how dentists, orthodontists, and lay people uh, evaluate these particular uh, variables. Now, some very, very interesting uh, study uh, from Turkey, uh, especially smile aesthetics, that is perception and comparison of untreated smile conclude with or without extractions not differentiated by six panel of judges. Something interesting, very interesting conclusions from this study is with the widening again did not actually make any difference on the smile aesthetics. What actually mattered was the maxillary gingival display. Mm -hmm. That's the gummy smile was uh, was a very definitive uh, variable and factor which actually dealt with uh, when it came on uh, to smile aesthetics. So that, that were pretty interesting conclusions. Uh, yeah, so concluding this uh, extraction versus non-extraction when it came to uh, self-ligating or conventional, is, uh, it's, it's for me, uh, the criteria for non-extraction, that is expansion, are definitely, definitely gonna be favorable soft tissue profile, good buckle bone thickness rather than just the buccal corridor. Lingual tipping of the lower posterior is like Dr. Said was mentioning. I would expand, definitely. Upright to retrocline lower incisors because I still have room to procline or upright the lower incisors, which would still keep it within the margins of stability, uh, like uh, Dr. Matsumoto in his study had uh, claimed uh, before. Uh, 50% increase in the chances of dehiscence. Uh, uh, one more thing is uh, good lip competency. If I have really good lip competency, you can play around with the uh, a little bit of proclination and a favorable curve of speed. If you have a very deep curve of speed, uh, you cannot reject or rebut the fact that you might need to extract because the minute you flatten the curve of speed, your incisors are just going to be flat. And that, that takes up a lot of space. The fact is that you must not consider are that you saw a similar case on Facebook the other day and so you would do it non-extraction following the same guidelines. The nasolabial angle is very favorable to extract or not extract as I have already proved to you before that nasolabial angle uh, can be the same in two absolutely different kind of malocclusions. Just because you wanna please the patient or you wanna be a non-extractionist or a propagator or a key opinion later, sometime later. So these are the factors that you must not, have, must not have in mind. Uh, before deciding whether you're going to go appliance-driven or diagnosis-driven. Now, let's debunk the second uh, very, very important uh, uh, question over here. Are they faster? Now, there are some studies, especially Dr. Miles is an authority on this subject. He has so many, so many uh, papers published, especially when it comes to self-ligation, conventional, the speed and the friction and uh, the aesthetics and all these things. And uh, he has concluded in one of his uh, landmark papers, especially self-ligating versus conventional twin brackets during end mass space closure with sliding mechanics. 13 patients completed the trial. The median rates of tooth movement for smart clip, he used smart clip, were 1.1 millimeter per month and conventional twin bracket was 1.2 millimeter per month. So that means conventional was a little faster in closing spaces 
compared to your self ligating brackets. There was another study uh, published in the AJODO, uh, which has mentioned the comparative assessment of alignment, efficacy, space closure of passive self ligating brackets versus conventional appliances and dolsons, which has again clearly stated that the time to initial alignment was significantly shorter for the conventional bracket than for either the active or passive self ligating brackets. So, this is the opposite of. In passive or no, total Brad, space we'll, loading we'll among the last three seconds. Okay, you might can wanna, you hear me now? You want to, you might, uh, yeah, you might want to push your table a little bit closer to your router. I don't know why it's happening. Okay, yep, better. Yep. Okay, so let's see how long it stays. So okay. the the next uh, study that I was citing was uh, uh, by a group in the UK who who clearly stated that the time to initial alignment was significantly shorter for the conventional brackets than for either the active or passive self ligating brackets. There was no statistically significant mm -hmm. difference in uh, in in passive, active, or total space closure times among the three brackets that are under investigation. And both, uh, there, were, there were some conventional brackets and self-ligating brackets. So this is absolutely opposite to what we uh, uh, are, are pushed to believe. But at the same time, uh, yeah, there is, another, there is another study by uh, uh, an authority on this subject again, that is a group uh, from Greece uh, uh, by uh, Dr. Elliot. Uh, he says again that overall, there is no difference in the time required to correct the mandibular crowding with Damon 2 and conventional brackets was observed. Now, on the other hand, there is this uh, paper uh, in a very reputed journal uh, that's uh, research in uh, uh, clinical orthodontics, uh, self ligating brackets and treatment efficacy by uh, uh, Dr. Haradin uh, from uh, UK again. Now, according to his research, in matched cases, Damon self ligating brackets produced statistically and clinically significant reductions in treatment time and number of patients' visits. The reduction in the time required to place and remove ligatures with these, with these self ligating brackets were modest and little clinical significance. Now, both types of brackets produced good and equivalent reduction in the occlusal irregularity. So now this is a contradicting uh, result. Now this result goes to say that the time involved with the treatments were severely and significantly reduced when using self ligating brackets. Now this paper also answers another very important question. Does the chair side time actually reduce while using self ligating brackets in comparison to conventional uh, uh, ligature type brackets? Uh, the answer to that question is no it does not actually improve any chair side time because the difference was just nine seconds, uh, which was actually not significant. Uh, and, but yeah, so you have a conflict now in terms of the speed with which uh, the treatment is finished when it comes to self ligating and conventional. There is another very interesting study, uh, again in the clinical orthodontics and research uh, journal uh, by uh, Dr. Tanke. This study, the conclusions were, this study demonstrated that Damon self-ligating system yields faster, better treatment results with fewer appointments for all clinicians. So damn, that is, that is, that is a, uh, that, that's a really, really uh, upright uh, conclusion. So according to him, Damon is way better than anything else. Uh, it, it yields faster, better treatment results with fewer appointments. So there you go. Uh, so now must be sponsored. Uh, no, I, I I wouldn't say that because the uh, the journal is really uh, a reputable journal. So it's 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 a very very uh, uh, big journal and uh, interesting one. Uh, I'm I'm surprised. Uh, 
But again, this contradicts Dr. Miles' uh, research in all possible ways. So again, I'm going to leave the conclusion up to you when it comes to what is, whether it is faster or not. In my personal experience, let me just tell you anecdotally that I have, uh, I have found that the appointments are lesser, definitely yes, because uh, when I use uh, self-ligating brackets, I call the patients every six weeks or seven weeks. And um, uh, the, the copper night eye wires, they, they have really nice resilience and uh, they're, they're very, very good wires to initially elevate crowding. And as Dr. Pao says, you need to leave the wire inside to cook a bit. And um, once the wire uh, does its job, you can see good results. And uh, because the forces are very low, and I'm going to get to that. I'm, I'm not just saying it. The, it's an evidence behind it. Uh, it, it, it gives you very nice uh, crowding correction in the initial stages. Uh, but again, when it comes to uh, uh, the regular brackets, uh, conventional brackets, I usually prefer uh, ligature tying them. Uh, with steel ligatures in the very beginning and tie the wire really tight into the wings, which give you higher forces compared to the very increased play that you can find between the 013 or 014 copper night eye and the huge uh, daemon slot, the 028 slot that you have over there. Uh, so, of course, the forces are uh, varied and, and absolutely different. Uh, the speed I, I wouldn't comment on the speed because I have almost found similar speed uh, when it comes to leveling alignment. Yes, the forces are way lower with uh, Damon or self-ligation. But when it comes to space closure, I've actually found no difference. I've in fact uh, uh, seen that the control is much more with conventional brackets. In my idea, it is because of uh, the tight contact that I probably would have with a module or with a ligature that would give me a good a uh, first order control and a third order control. I think we lose third order control torque uh, when it comes to using these daemon brackets because the brackets are just too big uh, when compared to the 019 by 025 wire, which we, which we would probably use for sliding, uh, which would lose out on the third order uh, when, when you retract. So uh, let's answer another very important question as to what's their effect on incisor inclination. Um, I have had many, many people tell me, uh, especially when it came to my class three or class two cases that you could have used it. You could have used the high torque bracket. You could have used low torque brackets in the incisors. You could have controlled the incisor inclination in, in, in different ways. But the issue is, uh, I do understand that it's very easy to control the inclination when you have space at the back. For example, it was an extraction case. Let's let's talk about an extraction case. And uh, uh, I, I I see my incisors are flared. I can definitely do many things. I can even um, uh, turn the brackets upside down or maybe use low torque brackets because I have space at the back. And I know that that space can be utilized to correct the inclination of the uh, front teeth. But what if I really am doing a case non-extraction? So I, I am not able to fathom the fact that in a non-extraction case, if we just use low torque brackets on the front, I would be able to control the inclination no matter what the crowding is at the back. Because at the, end, at the end, I need space to elevate that crowding. So that crowding is either going to go like this or like this. And like this is not stable. And like this is not stable either. So I have to have space at the end of the day. And uh, that, that space would either come by interproximal reduction or by extractions. So studies... Uh, like this study, again, by Dr. Elias and group uh, from Greece have put forward a very simple, straightforward conclusion that an alignment induced increase in the proclination of the mandibular incisors was observed in both conventional and self-ligating. Of course, uh, we usually do have it. And uh, there is no significant difference. So you can't claim... Uh, that self-ligation self probably has a better control over the inclination. Both tend to procline the incisors forward. Now, another paper uh, which was uh, published in the Open Journal of Dentistry uh, from Brazil, again concluded the same, on the same lines, that the changes in the maxillary and the mandibular incisor positions were similar. Both had mild protrusion and buccal inclinations. 
and there was no statistical difference between a uh, significant difference be between both these groups now uh, this study by dr myers uh, has answered so many questions uh, it's a very very interesting study which is published in the angle orthodontist a clinical trial of damon 2 versus conventional twin brackets during initial alignment how about the patient discomfort and pop outs with uh, damon uh, they claim that the patient discomfort is way lesser the pop outs are also uh, way lesser because of the uh, strong uh, mesh work that uh, is incorporated in the uh, self ligating or the damon uh, group but the results were pretty contradictory the twin bracket was more uncomfortable so we're talking about the conventional here the conventional brackets were more uncomfortable with the initial arch wire i suppose it is because of the high force involved because when we use a a, a conventional bracket we will have to really stuff the wire in the night eye inside with tight ligatures or modules that gives you gives the patient a a a, a high level of discomfort however after 10 weeks substantially more patients reported discomfort with the damon 2 brackets when engaging the arch wire so that means to say that in the initial phases damon or self ligation mm. are better but when it comes towards the 10 week phase they become uncomfortable now uh conventional brackets uh had basically now we have something called the irregularity index right it, it, that that is the uh, the crowding uh, you measure how how do you measure the crowding so uh basically at both arch wire changes at 10 to 20 weeks that is when the arch wires were changed in both conventional and the damon group at 10 to 20 weeks the conventional bracket had achieved a lower irregularity index than the damon 2 bracket that means to say that is better now my theory for that would again be the amount of play involved uh, i'm sure dr pau would have also noticed that for example i mean uh, you, you uh, uh, i'm sure many of you would have seen those butterfly incisors placed like this right and when you have those big bulky brackets the self ligating brackets and you pass an 014 wire or an 016 copper knight eye wire even after about 10 weeks if you don't change the wire the teeth are still like this because the brackets are just too bulky the slot is just too big for that small wire to actually give a deflection because ortho works the forces are generated by the deflection on the wire now if the wire itself is going straight although the teeth are Uh, uh rotated uh, it's not going to uh, derotate you need to engage a thicker wire now a thicker wire there would be maybe an 014 by 05 or an 016 by 02 which would cause more pain because at that one particular point it's going to engage on the periodontal fibers and it's going to just move the tooth out so that is going to uh, increase the amount of pain and that's probably why on wire changes the damon uh, heavier wires the damon probably the, the pain is much more and finally uh damon 2 brackets were no better during initial alignment than conventional brackets as we already discussed uh also uh one thing very uh, uh uh interesting was that more damon 2 brackets deep bonded during the study am i audible dr pau we lost you for 5 seconds for what oh. Yeah so uh one more very interesting part of this of the study was that the damon 2 brackets debonded more during the study uh that is aside from the claims uh, that their uh, highly improved and high tech uh mesh work uh is is going to keep them more stable so that answers the questions of patient discomfort over here and pop outs right so let's move on to the next question and the most uh this thing one minute Just give me a minute, please. Yeah. What about the tip and torque? Several investigators and many clinicians have reported difficulties in finishing patients with self-ligating brackets. Particularly, the torque and tip control can be compromised during the greater uh, part of the arch wire uh, in the slot for self-ligating brackets. Now, this uh, is a very clear understanding. uh again it revolves around the size of the slot the slot is slightly bigger so what happens is when you engage a wire for finishing or for retraction 
you're going to have loss of torque because the wire is not snug fit on the um, on the brackets, uh, the slots. So now comes the use of an active or a passive self ligating bracket. Actives claim to have better torque and tip control, but passives usually have the issues with loss of tip and torque when it comes to the final stages of treatment. Uh, and you have many references, as you can see over here, on the same uh, topic. Uh, now, how is rotational play affected? As I mentioned, and I've also given you an example in the last slides, so I'm not going to be going into uh, depth with this over here. Dr. Miles in his study has clearly again said that there's a lot of rotation loss, uh, leaving about 1.8 degrees of rotational play when a 16 by 22 inch arch wire is engaged on a Damon 2 bracket. So that means that mine, minor rotations are very, very hard to correct when it comes to using these bulky slot brackets. You need a snug fit. So now the most important question is, do they actually deliver light forces? And this is a very key to the use of self-ligation itself. So let me answer this question through a paper uh, in the Angle Orthodontist again. Evaluation of frictional resistance of conventional and self-ligating bracket designs using standardized arch wire and dental diapodons. When coupled with small wires like 014, 016, the self-ligating brackets performed better than conventional brackets. Now, why is it? Because for the 014 inch wire on the upper right quadrant, maximum drawing forces averaged 125 and 810 centinewton for self-ligating and conventional brackets respectively. So do you see the difference? It's 125 centinewtons compared to 810 centinewtons for conventional brackets. So that means that it is really light on the periodontion. It gives you those light biological forces, which are enough to alleviate the crowding, maintaining the biological integrity. So that's where it is good. So now, till now, I think it has two positives. One is the time, which is again a debatable topic, and light forces, which is conclusive. Now, do they really burn out less anchorage? Uh, one thing I've heard, and people have asked me a lot, that when we use Damon brackets, so when we use the brackets, the anchorage compared to conventional brackets. And uh, I wonder uh, that even there. I mean, even in my post-graduation, I, I used to wonder, and I never got a very clear picture to it. But now is when I actually, I mean, yesterday uh, is when I actually got a very clear picture to it. Uh, the reason behind the ideology of lesser anchorage burnout is that when you use a self for sliding mechanics, uh, the amount of friction is way lesser. That means the amount of force or the reciprocal force on your anchorage unit, that is the molar, is way lesser. And that is why you have lesser anchorage burn. So that is the philosophy and that is what what, what was taught to you. Uh, am I cut out, Dr. Pao? What? Did you, did you lose me? Uh, we're... You're fine, maybe about 80% uh, good. Okay, so, so the question again was, uh, the reason and the logic behind why Damon or self-ligating brackets would lose less anchorage, and that's, that's, uh, that's again anecdotal, that, that there is no hard evidence to that. But the, the logic is that uh, sliding mechanics, when, when using sliding mechanics, self-ligating brackets, the amount of uh, friction is lesser because the slot. So what happens is uh, the amount of force which is applied on the reciprocal anchorage unit, that's the molar, is lesser because of the less friction. And so the molar loses less anchorage. And that is the logic. But what happens in reality is, uh, is actually uh, uh, very clear and evident in this paper in the uh, uh, BMC Oral Health, which is a very, very reputed uh, journal. The meta-analysis, and that too, this is a meta-analysis. This is the highest level of evidence that you can have. The meta-analysis from six eligible studies showed that no statistical significant difference 
was observed between the two groups in the rate of canine retraction and loss of antero posterior anchorage of molars. Also, another very interesting study in the angle orthodontist, treatment time, outcome, anchorage loss, comparisons of self-ligating and conventional rackets, concludes that the treatment time and anchorage loss are not influenced by the type of bracket used. So what are they influenced by? I would say that uh, uh, anchorage loss is more influenced by the inclination of the molars, the, uh, the size of the anchorage segment. Also, it depends on... Uh, absolutely. So there, there are very less determinants to anchorage and, and uh, it, it can be more of common sense because I think is ligation, by the way, which, which, which will bring me to the next topic. So I'm going to clarify this later. Does the kind of ligation actually affect sliding? Now, that is the crux of our uh, lecture. The fact is, and this paper, this, this, this question means that does ligating it with module or with steel ligatures or with the clips actually affect sliding? The answer is clear in the evidence again in the angle orthodontist, which uh, clearly says that uh, in a paper, effects of ligation type methods on resistance to sliding of novel orthodontic brackets with second order angulation in dry and wet states. The study clearly states in the active configuration, binding behavioral patterns of brackets were not influenced by ligation methods. Also, another paper in a very reputed journal, as a journal of orthodontics, clearly says the hypothesis that reducing friction by modifying the bracket ligature interface increases the rate of space closure was not supported. The major determinant of orthodontic tooth movement is probably the individual patient response, which brings me to the very first slide again, that you cannot, you cannot say that just by reproducing the ligation on different patients, you can expect same amount of space closure. It depends primarily on the patient response, the biological response. And ligation is not a determinant factor for sliding. So you can forget about the factor of anchorage loss or any other thing. I think sliding more depends on the bracket width, the wire width, the, the configuration of the wire, the material uh, of, of the wire. Does it have more asperities? Does, does it have more notching? Uh, and the mechanics used, the direction of force. All these are the variables which involve uh, around the determinants of sliding and ligation rather than the brackets itself. So, this increased ability of teeth to slide along an arch wire comes at the cost of a reduced range of labiolingual correction, as I mentioned, that is the torque, rotation control for a given wire. Very simple. You might have more sliding because of the less friction, as they claim, but you would definitely have reduced ranges of torque control, rotation control, tip control as well. So, Pao, that was heavy, isn't it? Yep. Okay. Questions? Um, none that I have received mm -hmm. so far, but um, I, I like the points that you pointed out here. Um, all right. So, uh, I think some of these could be actually discussed within common sense. Um, yeah. Say, for example, the, the movement of teeth, whether it's going to be faster. Um, it's not really a matter of what you're using, but rather it's, um, it's the response of the bone towards the force that the dentist places. So the bone is oblivious to whatever you are placing on uh, on the teeth, and it's rather what rather what the bone gets is uh, how many grams of force did you apply, and that's what's going to yield to the movements or not yield in that sense. So, um, yeah, I agree with you. Say, to say that treatments are going to be faster, I have never experienced um, uh, that these treat treatments are going to be faster. And to say that it's faster, it, it's actually uh, highly subjective. I mean, uh, what is what are the parameters of saying that it's faster? Faster what? Faster between patients or faster within one patient? How fast should the treatment actually be? Uh, what is the basis of speed? Um, are we basing it on the whole treatment? Are we basing it on tooth movement? Are we uh, just because there's lesser friction, just because uh, the the uh, slots are bigger? 
uh, is it uh, based on the individual tooth movement or is it, is it based on the treatment as a whole? I think one of the factors that uh, the, the claims of treating patients faster with SLB is that uh, you don't really get to go into uh, the stage of space consolidation. You usually just stay within the stage of leveling alignment and just go straight into finishing which is uh, like you know what what is being publicly advocated in 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 uh, uh, in social media, but the truth of the matter is that not all patients can be treated with uh, um, uh, non non extraction treatment. If you treat an Asian uh, who who already has a bimax bidental protrusion, and then you're going to use uh, self ligation, and you have to do extraction either way. I I I agree with you. There's still not going to be any difference with that, with with how you're going to end because um, and this will be a part of my lecture. The the treatments basically with, with self ligation, the only advantage of self ligation will be in the transverse dimension or maybe in the alignment part. That's where this fourth wall is going to give you an advantage. But then in terms of moving it sagittally, like as you uh, in the uh, last article that you showed. Ligation does not um, the ligation does not really affect the the initial distal movement of the teeth because the the brackets would move along the wire in determinant of the proximal movement. It, it doesn't move buccal or lingual. Absolutely, what, what the movement is actually initial and distal. So, so there's no mm. uh, the context of um, um, of a contest here really is uh, uh, zero to begin with. Uh, just the same as the argument in the tissue reaction. If you're loading high, of course, you're going to get more uh, resistance there because you're uh, applying, uh, I mean, you're, you're trying to elicit a hyalinization response, and that's going to delay some type of movement. So um, it's, it's a, uh, I like what you pointed out here that we're basically just clearing out this misnomers that are actually not pointed out uh, when it comes to uh, sitting down in, in these uh, big events and just listening and saying that things are Absolutely. faster, things are much more beautiful. Absolutely, I mean, and, true. And it just makes much more sense. Yeah. Um, I just have a question by Dr. Vikram. He wants to know whether actually Damon, is there any evidence uh, uh, which claims that Damon probably expands more? So I, I, I kept the slide over here. Does it get the bone along while expanding the arch? Um, so uh, studies have very clearly stated that. In, in, now this very interesting paper by Dr. Elliott again, self ligation versus conventional brackets and treatment of mandibular crowding, a prospective clinical trial of treatment duration and dental effects. The results were increased with associated with crowding correction regardless of bracket groups were noted. So that means, as I've mentioned, both these groups showed increase in the intercanine width. Self-ligating group showed more statistically greater intermolar width increase than the conventional group. Now, the question is, is it stable? Another very interesting paper published in the Dent Press Journal of Orthodontics by Dr. Almeida concludes, there was no significant difference between self-ligating brackets and conventional bracket systems regarding mandibular arch expansion and changes in buckle bone thickness or transversal width of buckle bone. And uh, I would like to point out, there was this very, very interesting editorial by Dr. Uh, Sheldon Peck. Uh, and uh, he had uh, he he was he was very clearly pointing out that all the propagators they they show the CBCTs. I mean, some of them do show CBCTs, but they're very foggy. They do claim to have some amount of buckle bone around the expanded teeth, uh, just to prove the fact. But not clear. So a lot of evidence is still needed. We can't debunk the fact that Damon is uh, uh, falsely claiming such things. There may be, but I would really urge uh, people to come out with CBCT studies to prove very clearly that it's not just dental tipping. It's more of bone uh, uh, along with tooth expansion. Now, the only way you can claim or you can debunk that fact is the myth is by proving with x-rays, with CBCTs. And no matter what, uh, uh, otherwise, 
makes no sense. Okay. Uh, if I may just show my uh, my screen, Dr. Sure. Addis, uh, I would just like to share some kind of uh, force, um, something that I learned. Definitely. Yeah, because anyways, after that, I'm getting the cases. Can you just exit your screen, please? I'm sorry, I forgot. <laughs> Wait, let me, why is it so hard? Okay, yeah. All right. Okay, um, this is one of the points that uh, uh, Dr. Giorgio Fiorelli actually was sharing um, in one of his webinars. Uh, very interesting point because he was also asked, uh, he doesn't use self-ligating, he uses the statically determinate system where he does uh, um, segmental mechanics, but he does a lot of these expansions. And one of the questions that he received was uh, uh, the, the stability of the bone in that area. And um, uh, the principle uh, which we could perhaps look at is that if you have a center of resistance, okay, here in the uh, in the red dot, right, and you want to move it towards the side, and the force application, okay, or the force level is applied on the coronal side, then you get this tipping, and in this tipping part, basically, you you get a lot of um, stress there on the marginal ridge of your, uh, I mean, on the uh, edge of your bone, so on the cervical part. So uh, the, the interesting point here is that you, if you attack your center of resistance and you apply a low continuous force, uh, what Dr. Fiorelli shared was that you, you get to expand this bone and you bring bone along with it through this low type of forces. Now, there would be some cases that would already have a generous amount on the buccal side of the bone wherein what you're actually doing is uprighting. It's not really a, 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 a translatory movement towards the buckle. So there would be a difference over there because um, uh, the difference would be mainly that if you apply a, a type of mechanics in one patient, it would not necessarily work for another. And this is where the importance of your CBCTs would fall in, in determining whether you can or you cannot uh, take into uh, consideration the um, the advantages of these materials yeah that's all yeah that's pretty interesting but the hard here. part but the hard part over with this is uh uh okay yeah so the hard part with what you showed is to get to the point of force application don't you think so yeah yeah because uh, we're nowhere close to the center of resistance. And it's very hard to generate forces at that level, especially from the palatal side, because all our uh, appliances are buckle, isn't it? So it becomes very hard to generate that amount of force when it comes from the palatal. So if we are successful in generating forces uh, from that aspect, I'm sure the, uh, the entire game will change. I would agree. It's very, uh, it's very difficult. I mean, uh, this transverse or arch development, as they would call it, is a part that is actually considered in the alignment stage, which is at the mm -hmm. very start. And in the alignment stage, you're using very thin wires. And if you're trying to develop it at a very, at, a, um, at, at that time period, it's going to be a challenge because you're using very thin wires, which would not be able to uh, transform your mechanics moment in the moment sense towards your center of resistance. So um, I think it will be uh, it will make sense that a statically determinate system would be applied, and that's the only way that you can get the responses. But with a statically indeterminate system, which we are almost all used to, you know, just using a straight wire, this is almost uh, impossible. I Absolutely. think people just get it more into uprighting rather than bodily movement. True. Okay, so uh, getting on to the clinical uh, representation of uh, such cases. Uh, now, one thing I would like to uh, just clarify over here is uh, that my usage of uh, uh, self-ligation brackets 
uh, are absolutely based on uh, what uh, on it's it's not on the treatment. It's it's upon what the patient wants, and uh, of course, uh, mm-hmm. I, I'll be honest over here. Mm-hmm. Uh, the fact is that self ligation brackets are uh, more expensive than conventional brackets, and at the same time, uh, when when usually we have uh, uh, a consult. Uh, I, I give them a particular treatment plan and I give them options because for me, uh, all the brackets are pretty much the same. Uh, it's just that I work for a hospital. So uh, you, can, you, can, uh, you can understand that uh, a self-ligation bracket costs more. So we charge the patient more. And so for that particular reason is uh, why most of my patients have self-ligation because when you have your daughter come in and I tell them that, okay, fine, this is the conventional bracket. This is the uh, uh, the daemon or the self-ligating bracket. This is a little more expensive because uh, because of uh, uh, the fourth wall and the clip, and you don't have to use ligations and all those things. The parent definitely wants uh, the the better one, uh, at least cost-wise, because cost uh, the the higher cost uh, gives them a false uh, 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 identification of uh, what's better, uh, and and they go for that. And so that's exactly why most of my patients have uh, self ligating uh, brackets. It's not, it's not for the treatment. It's, it's uh, or, or uh, appliance driven ortho. It's, it's just because of the fact that they choose the higher option. And it's as simple as that. So this particular case again came in the office and um, she's pretty young. She has a good, decent profile, good amount of crowding. As you can see that I have very little space over here to get this particular lateral incisor out. Uh, but in this particular case, I had made it, I, I made a mistake again, uh, to not go the extraction way and to go the non-extraction way, looking at, um, you know, different, uh, claims, uh, from, uh, gurus of, uh, uh, non-extraction. And, um, I gave it a go, like I gave it a go in the first case, uh, in that, in that particular girl. So, uh, over here, you can see that. I had placed an open coil spring, a really long one, because I didn't want to engage the lateral incisor. You never do in such cases because that just proclines the lateral incisor way out and uh, pushes the root back onto the canine and you'll have torque issues. So I wanted to gain some good space. Once I gained good enough space, I engaged the lateral incisor, started getting space for the canine. Finally, I got the canine down as well. And I was waiting for this particular uh, uh, primary tooth to come out and uh, the fives to erupt and once that happened i maintained the space with an open coil spring uh simultaneously corrected that the overjet using class two elastics which definitely proclined the lower incisors forward in this particular case because that's exactly where the teeth would go and as you can see i was able to slowly gain space now what i feel is uh i could have done the same thing with uh, conventional brackets I, I don't see anything that this particular bracket is doing differently that a conventional bracket cannot do. I would, again, I could do the case similarly using the regular MBT brackets, use the same mechanics, put ligature, steel ligature ties and get the same amount of, uh, uh, of uh, 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 correction. So wh- what's the difference? Number one is that the biological response may be better here because as we have proved already through evidence, that the forces, the drawing forces are 125 centinewtons compared to 810 centinewtons in conventional brackets. And number two is that uh, definitely, if, if uh, I, mean, I mean, in terms of usage, in terms of usage of uh, conventional brackets, uh, the cost would be another factor. Uh, she would have spent less. Now, as you can see, I was able to get a decent finish, but the superimpositions will clearly show that I have proclined the lower incisors and the upper incisors, and that is evident in the profile. So now I can hoodwink people as much as possible saying that, no, she's just put on a little fat and uh, the profile is actually not proclined. But the basic truth lies in the CEF and the superimpositions. You can uh, clear, I sorry, I didn't attach the superimpositions, but yeah, it's very clear and evident in the CEF itself that the incisors have proclined. And you can see the reciprocal effect on the profile as well. She's okay with it, and that's why I'm still okay with it. We're losing you a little bit, Dr. Adit. 
Yeah, which which parts? Which part did he lose out? No, just at uh, just at the start of the next patient. The patient, right? Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. So. So I didn't think. Not being very clear right now. Okay. So uh, let's go. Let's go on to the next uh, case. Um, now, this case again, uh, as you can see, moderate amount of crowding on the upper incisor area, and uh, a decent profile to begin with. The teeth inclinations are pretty uh, standard. So what I did was, uh, in this particular case, I used anterior bite blocks uh, uh, and I used these mild class two elastics over here, gained some space, the, the, the regular natural way. Now, again, use of a conventional bracket in this particular case may not have made any difference. It's a question of extracting or not to extract. That is the primary uh, concern. So it's more of a diagnostic issue than an appliance issue in th these cases. And as you can see, I was able to generate, uh, 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 I mean, get get good amount of correction with the crowding. And I use the standard torque brackets. I do not use any high or low torque. But you can see the finish also is good. But you can see the change in the IMPA. I changed the IMPA from 88 degrees to 95 degrees. That's about seven degrees. And again, according to the paper from Matsumoto, he is going to lose his gums probably uh, pretty soon. Uh, that's that's about a 50% chance of him uh, having uh, dehiscence on the incisor area, lower incisor area especially. You can also clearly see that the upper incisors have proclined, but not too much, just, just by two degrees. Uh, yeah, so coming on to the next uh, part is uh, the space closure. Now, again, people have seen this case. It's a case of a bidental protrusion by maxillary protrusion, uh, which was Lost you for the past so, 10 seconds. Yeah. Hello? Dr. Aziz. Yeah, are you? Yeah. Uh, your connection is a little poor uh, from the start of this case. So we, we if you can just go back. Not much. Yeah, Dr. Addis, I think we lost you completely. Hold on. So we're just uh, trying to fix our uh, just a little bit of technical difficulty with Dr. Addis. Uh, we won't be. This won't take long. Hold on. Yeah, I'm, I think I'm back. Yep, you're back. All right. I switched off and on my Wi-Fi connection again. I hope that helps. Okay, so let's let's move on 
uh, with this particular case, and I think many of you have already seen this case again. This is a retreatment case uh, which came in uh, after self-ligation. That is when the dentist proclined all her teeth in order to alleviate the crowding. And uh, so now uh, her, she, her chief complaint was that she actually looks like a, a, a monkey. And uh, she wanted to uh, get her lips back, correct her profile and all those things. So definitely extractions were in order. Extracted the first and second bicuspids in the upper. As you can see, the lower molars are absolutely mutilated. They can just fall off anytime. So I, I can't get any kind of anchorage sub support from them. So I decided to place uh, the buckle shelf and go in for end mass distalization. Uh, again, as I always say, you must take a CBCT in order to rule out the proximity of the distolingual root to the mylohyoid ridge before uh, attempting any kind of end mass distalization procedure uh, on the lowers especially. Uh, now, as you can see, the brackets are conventional brackets. These are just the regular MBT brackets. Now, as, uh, as, as, as you would have seen on other channels or other papers, most of these procedures are done on uh, self-ligation brackets now uh, because of the low force and all those claims. Uh, but yeah, what I'm trying to say is that conventional or self-ligation doesn't really matter. Uh, you could use the same mechanics on any bracket uh, and you could get the same kind of results. And you can see over here that I was able to distalize the, man, uh, the mandibular dentition quite a bit. You can see the change in the profile, that's huge. And you can see the amount of distalization that I achieved on the lower molar, which is more than about six millimeters, which is unlike uh, the stereo uh, the type of uh, uh, evidence, which claims that you could just distalize for just about three millimeters. There are some exceptions in which it is possible. It depends on the anatomy behind the second molar. Again, a similar case, uh, which all of you have seen again, and uh, this is a loss of anchorage case, a uh, retreatment case in which uh, the patient hydrogenically was led up to a situation like this. And I had to use the brackets, uh, which are conventional because the patient was already undergoing treatment for a long time. Uh, as you can see, uh, the inclination of all his teeth are really pro proclined. The roots are right, right outside the palatal bone. Uh, my objectives were to get the lowers in and uh, auto rotate the mandible because such mechanics, whenever you use buckle shelf, uh, by the way, uh, the, the posteriors go down and the anteriors go up and induce a counterclockwise rotation on the mandibular occlusal plane, which is good for the open bite. And as you can see, exactly that's what happened. Uh, by the end of distalization, you can see that I was able to generate a counterclockwise rotation of the mandible, which helped me close the open bite. And as and when I uh, got good amount of overjet, I uh, added in uh, the upper brackets and uh, started using light 5 by 16 elastics from the upper canines onto the lower buckle shelf because I didn't want to procline the lowers. If I would have used the elastics from the upper canines onto the lower molars, it would have proclined the lower incisors forward again, uh, which I didn't want. So I continued the distalization. And at the same time, I uh, uh, started uh, tipping the upper teeth back, as you can see. Uh, now, this is the stage where I jumped into a uh, rectangular night eye. And here it's, it's, it's on a 19 by 25 stainless steel. And you can see that I've gained good amount of control. What I'm trying to show is not the mechanics over here. It's the use of conventional brackets for even such cases. Uh, most of you, uh, would have it uh, etched in your head uh, because of the notions that you see on social media, etc. Uh, that self-ligation and buckle shelf and can can go with demon. So I mean, it's it's a standard. I, I think Dr. Power would also agree with it. Buckle shelf uh, uh, equals uh, demon with buckle shelf distalization. It's always like that because that's how we see it. What I'm trying to show is uh, that you could use any kind of bracket. You can use even a conventional bracket with modules to get the same desired result. And as you can see, the case was finished. Uh, spinal aesthetics have improved, but the case is still a surgical case. Uh, the patient did not agree for surgery. Uh, and you can see the amount of uh, uh, control tipping uh, around the central resistance of the upper incisor and the retraction and the tipping on the lower incisors as well in this particular case, which is evident in the superimposition. Now, this is a, this is a very interesting case, uh, which I would like to point out. I, I think I think many, very few of you would have seen this case. Uh, in this case is of a, of a young man uh, with, a, with a class three uh, deep underbite and uh, with a very deep curve of speed on the lower. Uh, now this case, uh, th this is what makes it hard. Uh, the open bites for me are fairly easy to correct, but uh, these, these cases are slightly more challenging. Uh, 
uh, because they involve a deep curve of speed and the lowers are retroclined already. So uh, I, I hope you understand that any kind of flattening of the curve of speed would involve me to operate the lower in sizes and that is gonna put me into a situation where the underbite increases all the more. Uh, also another challenge with such cases is that when you correct the anterior crossbite, the incisal display is very, very minimal. Uh, Dr. Pao, have you noticed that in these cases? Whenever you jump the bite in such cases, when the patient smiles, you hardly see the incisors more. Uh, you have really, really reduced incisal dis uh, smile displays uh, when you correct such cases of uh, deep underbite class threes, uh, because you tend to intrude the upper incisors uh, fair, fair, more, uh, a, a lot, which would uh, reduce their display. Absolutely. Yeah, so now you can see the objectives in this case. What I need to do is I need to retract the lower arch. You see that his mandibular angle is pretty flat. Uh, the curve of speed is deep. And as I have mentioned, uh, I'm again going to reiterate, beautiful study by uh, Rosie and team, uh, which moves around the curve of speed in different skeletal patterns. If you have a deep curve of speed and you run a flat wire on a high angle, on a high angle, what you would want usually is the lower incisors to go down, intrude and flatten the curve. That's what you want ideally on a high angle. You don't want the molars to extrude, but unfortunately when you place a flat wire on a high angle, that's not what happens. What happens is the molars extrude. And so you get a clockwise rotation of the mandible, which is detrimental to a class two, maybe favorable on a class three. But on a, on a flat pro, uh, or on a low angle, you want slight amount of uprighting of the posteriors in order to gain the vertical. And you don't want much of intrusion on the lowers, but unfortunately what happens is that the curve flattens by proclination and intrusion of anteriors rather than any kind of uprighting of the posteriors. So in this case, she was a flat la, low angle. And what I did, is exactly, I placed bite blocks on the lower anteriors because I didn't want them uh, to, uh, uh, to, to extrude. But I wanted this particular segment over here to come up. And uh, so that's exactly what happened. Now, now what, what happened is, uh, in a low angle, I want this part to come up. And so I started using elastics in a distal fashion. And you can see that the curve is flattened. And I usually use two hooks for distalization because uh, uh, in my opinion, this is again anecdotal and it's not evidence-based uh, that I, I find some kind of a vertical bowing when I use uh, the power chain directly from the buckle shelf over here to this anterior hook. Uh, although the wire is stiff, I still notice uh, that and also the power chain usually gets in the gums. So to avoid that, I first start with this hook distal and then later on I engage it onto this hook. I divide the forces to 150 grams each, cumulatively getting onto about 300 grams per screw to the end. And uh, so you can see over here that uh, from a progression of a very deep curve, I was able to upright the lower incisors and get a good finish on this case. So starting from here, I ended up in upright incisors and a decent, a decent finish on this particular class three. This was not a very easy case, but yeah, if managed well with conventional brackets, I've done that. So now this is just an, an example as to what I was talking about, the incisal display. Primary concern, especially with post-treatment, uh, correcting such incisors are that you lose incisal display. Uh, like in this case, you can see that I'm uh, jumping the bite over here. I'm using an intrusion arch on the upper. And uh, when I completed my intrusion, you can see that the incisors have gone up and the patient has absolutely lost visibility of her upper incisors. Uh, all she shows is the lower incisors. So my solution to this pro problem is the use of reverse curve night eyes on the upper. I usually start using reverse curve night eyes on the upper in order to extrude the incisors back down, gain over jet. And there is a possibility that you might uh, create a posterior open bite the, with the use of posterior with the elastics, uh, sorry, with the reverse curve but you could use box elastics in order to curb that issue. Uh, now let's go on to another case uh, of heavy crowding. And I'm gonna be showing you how I have corrected this case. This case was treated with self ligation and a similar crowding was corrected with conventional brackets. And I have used the same mechanics. There is no daemon mechanics used here. So as you can see over here, 
uh, in any particular case, I would use the same. I've uh, bypassed the teeth that were uh, very difficult to engage. I've used an 016 or a 014 thermal night eye. I use early elastics, not only in conventional, but I use them in self -lig sorry, in self ligating, but I use them in conventional brackets as well. And uh, this is just in order to get the canines down. Uh, ideally, I would not have engaged this canine. Uh, I may have just bypassed this canine uh, and uh, so on. So yeah, uh, now then getting on to the next uh, stages are the, the, the regular stages. I mean, it's just uh, uh, placing the rectangular wires and the elastics uh, and all those uh, and, uh, and the regular stuff. And uh, finally, as you can see, that I was able to get the situation back in control into a decent situation where she is at right now. So what I'm trying to show over here is not the mechanics aspect. What I'm trying to prove here is that I have used the similar kind of uh, uh, mechanics in both conventional as well as in self-ligating to get similar results. Not the same results, but yeah, they're almost the similar results. So I don't vary my mechanics much when it comes to brackets. I use the same mechanics. Now, this is a case with uh, an animal defect. Uh, again, heavy crowding. Uh, this were those times where I was I was really impressed by self-ligating brackets, and I used to do anything with self-ligating brackets, try to get any kind of crowding alle alleviated. So I placed in the wires, I placed in all these springs in in uh, in in the hope that they would just gain space. Waited, 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 and still nothing happened. And there was a stage where I was just proclining the teeth. I even went into two arch wires in order to procline or to alleviate the crowding. As you can see, I've used a heavy overlay and then I've used an 012 thermal night eye to get those light forces. Uh, I, I tried everything, but it didn't happen. And finally, I had to resort to extractions. And as you can see, extractions have helped me out, corrected the uh, inclination of teeth. And I'm in a situation like this. I know he has a very bad animal defect, but I'm sure that after placing the veneers and after getting his teeth in uh, the right order, he's gonna get a new life altogether. Uh, what I'm trying to show is this case. Now this case is this monk, uh, he has this very similar malocclusion to the case that I showed you three cases back. And I've used uh, the regular conventional brackets on him. Placed mini screws from day one, extracted day one, started retraction on a light night eye. And uh, as you can see, I've placed the mini screws on the lower. I've started uh, retracting on a heavy wire. And wh what I realized is once the bite jumped, uh, he had a functional shift to the mandible as well. And so as you can see, the big mandibular uh, uh, midline shift. So, and, and I have absolutely no space over here to correct the mandibular midline. So what I decided is to extract the third molars and place this screw, replace it to a buckle shelf. And as you can see till here, yeah, from here, it's a buckle shelf now. And uh, unilateral distalization is on. I'm pulling only on one side to get the midline corrected. As you can see, the midline is severely off here. Getting on, 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 and on here. Uh, again, uh, so this is this is the final case that I'm I'm trying to show uh, a case of very very uh, severe crowding, and uh, as you can see again, I've started with uh, the same mechanics over here. I've engaged the teeth all over the place. Now this is a mistake. Uh, I would not do this. The question is reproducibility again. I did this on one case. As you can see, such a high canine. I pulled it down with the elastics. It's coming down, coming down, coming down. And you can see over here that it's already okay in, in its position. But when you try doing this on other cases, uh, you might not get the same results. You might find that these teeth really extrude. And this particular teeth will go up. You will find a very huge posterior open bite. You will have flaring of the incisors. And this case is going to go from a difficulty index of four or five to just a 10, which would be very, very difficult to control. So again, what I'm trying to say is you can use mechanics. You can try them out. If they don't work, you have to immediately change and don't ever think that one mechanics for all is going to work. It's not going to work. So the conclusions of my lecture today are, and this is a very strong conclusion. Seasoned orthodontists know well that natural equilibrium or homeostasis wins eventually. So we had better work with nature than dream up a system that works against her. 
So I hope all of you really take these conclusions seriously. Think for yourself. I'm going to, I'm not going to give you conclusions on self ligation versus uh, conventional. It's up to you to decide for me. It's the biology, the mechanics that matters more than the brackets. I hope it's the same with all of you as well. I would definitely agree. Thank you, uh, Dr. Adit, for, um, for that um, insight, for those insights. Um, I would definitely agree with uh, everything that Dr. Adit said. And, and um, what, what Dr. Adit did was basically he, he broke down uh, all these uh, misnomers or the, the false um, advertising, as I would say. You see, uh, as emotional human beings, the, these manufacturers will always try to to hit that part of you and say, like, this is the best, this is the solution. And uh, what we're what we're trying to say here is that um, not everything that would they would say would apply to your case, especially if, if the races uh, would, would conflict. Um, we should look at things from an objective manner, and our objective manner would still be through that um, proper process of the diagnosis, wherein you look at the X-rays, you look at the limitations of your case, and then that's when you, where you assess. I think the main trouble with, uh, nowadays is that there's such an abundance of information available, and um, you know if you have like a simple, if you have a problem that you're treating. And then you look it up in the internet, suddenly all of these would just come in and you think that, oh, maybe that would shoot in into my treatment plan. And that's where uh, what Dr. Adam basically broke down here is that you have to look sharply into uh, the methodology of those, um, of, of those studies or of, of the cases that he showed. Does it apply to yours? Does the uh, methodology of that um, speaker or the KOL Speaking to you, is, does it apply the same to yours? The, do the exclusion and exclusion criteria of those uh, patients that your KOL had or Dr. Addis had is the same with yours in order for you to be able to place it? And this, I think, would really underline the importance of the dentist and basically say that, hey, you're the one in control here. It's not your appliance or it's not anything uh, that is uh, being claimed upon by this system. Uh, again, what the uh, what your patients would always feel at the end of the day would be the grams of force that it, it, that it receives, not the appliance that you place. It won't know it. So it, it, it would not, it would certainly not give you anything significant in that manner. So let's just uh, answer two questions here. One from Dr. Jose uh, Jacob. What's your take on variable torques on self ligation? Do you feel it has its advantage? I personally don't. What do you think, Dr. Adam? I think it has uh, a limited advantage. Uh, I mean, uh, you need to use those uh, heavy wires in order to get uh, the, in order to get the absolute advantage. You can use a low torque on uh, uh, on, on on cases which involve uh, proclination of incisors to maintain the incisal block proclination, and you can use high torque where you need to retract and you don't want the incisors to dump. But I would use them very cautiously in extraction cases especially. I would not use them on non-extraction cases without space as there is a risk of exposure of root because of the increase in exaggerated torque values when it comes to high and low torque brackets. I'll definitely agree. If you look into the, uh, um, into the classification of the uh, torques, the variable torques of this, you're, you're going to see in the manufacturer's instructions that the, limit, the indications are basically limited only to the leveling and alignment stage, not really to the finishing. And again, um, in, in the finishing stage, uh, in the twerking stage, you know, these, these brackets don't really have that much of a power unless you use those really, really thick wires. Next up uh, from Dr. Corina Netku, uh, where do you insert the buckle shelf to distalize unilateral after you extract the third molar? I place them in the buckle shelf. That is somewhere right uh, alongside the first and second molar. You can palpate it with your thumb and uh, you can feel it. And then you can just insert the buckle shelf screw, which is uh, of about 1.8 into 10 millimeters dimension that I use. Yeah. I use, and then you uh, can use uh, it unilaterally. The, the wire is 1925. You can use a single hook and you can just dislice on one side. 
these buckle shelf implants are like uh, um, uh, they're they're I don't know black magic. <laughs> well, they're saviors. You can yeah. see that case. You can see that case. I really screwed up the midline, and I had no space on the right side. So you need to get the third molar out, of course, and then yeah, you can just move it. I love these buckle shelf implants, eh? but there's a little bit of a uh, curve in terms of studying or or starting up uh, using these. Uh, implants. Uh, definitely, you have to uh, use a CBCT in terms of uh, placement of this, even just uh, localizing on that area where you need to place it so you would objectively know it. You can look into this from a panoramic, you can look at this from a periapical radiograph. More and so finally, again, yes. more so again, because you want to know that there is some amount of distance you have behind the second molar, and the second and the distolingual root is not in contact with the mylohyoid ridge already. Uh, or else it's pointless yeah. to try to dislize. It won't dislize. It'll just tip the second molar. It won't go back. Yeah. All right. And my, uh, final question from Dr. Manas Mukashi. Uh, so, Doc, should the third molar uh, should be extracted right away before distalization? Absolutely. On the, th the third molars need to be dislized, uh, sorry, extracted immediately. Uh, it would be better because it would take advantage of the uh, RAP phenomenon. That's the regional acceleratory, uh, acceleratory a phenomenon over there, which would induce good amount of translation when it comes to the second moment. All right. So uh, we have no further questions. Uh, uh, should we wrap up, Dr. Addis? Yeah, absolutely. I think we should wrap up. And uh, uh, so today's uh, today's lecture was absolutely more on a review or a systematic review, rather, on all the uh, papers that possibly uh, which which uh, get get you the evidence uh, on the table. And uh, I hope this clarified most of the doubts in basis in terms of force systems, extractions, non-extractions, arch width, proclination, and everything. So um, I'm, I'm sure the next lecture is going to be great in terms of mechanics uh, when it comes to using self ligations. Yeah. So uh, we're not going to follow our usual uh, three-hour time or four-hour time. Uh, today's not going to be a marathon. So we're going to make it short. Next week, uh, tune back in. Uh, I'll be the one presenting a little bit more on the mechanics and the science of this uh, ligation systems. And hopefully we can enlighten you on its uh, disadvantages and also advantages. So we'll see you again next week. Thank you for tuning in here tonight. Uh, this link will be replayable for... Uh